Hello again, and welcome to Restaurant Review. I'm your host, Bob Bockelman, as you know by now. And once again, we're back uh, with a great new live show for you. It's uh, nearing the end of March. Uh, the weather's starting to warm up. Uh, we've got a lot of good things. This year has been early, so we've got Easter just flew by, and everyone's getting ready to look forward to the Jazz and Heritage Fest, which is only less, probably less than a month away right now. Anyway, the most important thing, of course, is bringing you our new restaurants and musicians. Now, today I will apologize. We do not have a musician. And uh, rather than uh, let you suffer, for those who've seen the last few shows with that same musician, uh, even though she's very, very talented, it's not fair, really, to her to keep uh, exploiting her musical talent on the show. So what we want to do, again, is put an appeal out to you. You know, if you know any musicians that want to be on the show, we would love to have them. We're always looking for new talent to expose to the city, uh, and we welcome some contact us through the website or whatever. Um, we just really need uh, these people because we like to keep our show totally live, not just uh, from the uh, restaurant standpoint. So that means today, for the good, of the, hopefully the good of it, that we have approximately 15 more minutes of talk time so we can really talk in depth with regard to our restaurant. Also, I've asked our director to uh, definitely open up our telephone lines. I'm hoping uh, some of you folk out there will give us a call, not only about this great new restaurant, but anything you have in your mind about uh, restaurants in general in the city. So please take advantage of that. Hopefully uh, you know those numbers, the same two numbers we always have, uh, but they will be published or anything. So don't hesitate to pick up that phone and give us a call. Okay, uh, we want to tell you about our restaurant today and introduce the manager of the restaurant. It's uh, a brand new, what I call, Pan-Asian restaurant. And what does that mean, Pan-Asian? That means it's uh, dealing with almost every Asian nationality as possible. In the old days, everything was specific. You went to a Chinese restaurant, you went to a Thai restaurant, you went to a Japanese restaurant. Well, back in the 80s and 90s with the idea of food fusion, uh, different nationalities started crossing each other in their uh, recipes and their menus and in their styles. And because Asian is so plentiful, uh, we, it is even more important that, more, that you get introduced to the multiple different styles. And since uh, we're not a big enough city to have almost every nationality of Asian restaurant, this is a good example where you probably can find at least one dish of a nationality that we may not even have a restaurant here locally. So it's really great great idea. And for those who haven't guessed already, the name of the restaurant is Ho Shun. And uh, there you go. See it up there. Beautiful new establishment. It's in the, I believe, the 1600 block of St. Charles. We'll get corrected if I'm wrong. Um, uh, this is longstanding. Uh, we've, uh, they've been working on this building for so long, and I believe it has a hotel attached. But the most important thing is the restaurant decor is is really super. And we want to go ahead and introduce right now to you the manager of Hosha, and it's Stanley Ho. Stanley, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Bob. Appreciate Great. It. As you saw a couple of pictures of the interior of your restaurant, tell us the most specifically when you did open, and let's talk particularly about yourself, your family, which has been in the business so long, and also, uh, you know, your specifics of operation. So let's start with, uh, uh, let's talk about you and your family, first of all, how you all got in cooking and, and go from there. Sure. My dad was the uh, proprietor of JD's Restaurant, uh, which has been uh, in Metairie for a very, very long time. Very long and, time. And uh, right. they moved over to Five Happiness Restaurant. Everyone's familiar, at least with pa Five at Peggy Lee's place. And Absolutely. And been there for eons, even sure. how his dad is a recognized face. Uh, you'll see him, I uh, won't see him on camera, I don't believe, today, but at the important thing, you'll always see him at his new restaurant. He's so proud. And go ahead, Stanley, didn't mean to interrupt you. I'll talk a little bit more about the family before we move right into the restaurant. Well, sure. You know, my dad's been in the industry for quite a quite a few years, and, uh, you know, we're super proud of the place. And, you uh, Everybody that comes in, they really, you know, that's the most intriguing thing about the restaurant is that my father's always there, my mother's always there, and I'm always there. My dad opens the door every single day, and I close the door every single day. And, <laughs> the family uh, is married to the restaurant. Absolutely, absolutely, Bob. And, but that uh, is the key to a successful restaurant is that visibility and that ha always having someone of responsibility in charge. It gives that customer, the dining customer, a great feeling to know that, you know, he has someone looking out for his benefit there. Absolutely. Okay, let's talk about specifics. When did you all uh, open uh, this year? 
Uh, we opened up about eight weeks ago, and uh, it's been a roller coaster ride ever since. And uh, you, know, it, you know, we have a lot of growing pains in a new restaurant, but you know, we're very, very happy where we're at right now, and uh, we're super proud of all of our customers that come in. You know, we're situated in the heart of the Garden District, and we get the best customers. And our menu really allows us to actually have a wide range of customers. Um, you know, you can right. come in and get you know Vietnamese dishes, and you could uh, you know you could have. Uh, have right about you know fourteen dollars a head, or you could actually come in and have uh, lots of people that come in with Japanese dishes that you know, could really, really get a lot of nice things on the dishes for them. Okay, well that's that's great, and we know that is the case. And not only the the look of the restaurant will draw anyone everywhere, and, and the curiosity. I know people have been watching that building for several years, at least post Katrina, to see what was going to be there, and now it's this magnificent restaurant. Now you've got it divided into several dining rooms. Um, uh, approximately, how many do you see downstairs? Uh, downstairs, uh, that's the first uh, dining room. That's the main right there. And that is going to be overlooking St. Charles Avenue, right, uh, right on the, the avenue. Look right onto the avenue. Sure, huh? the streetcar passes right there. Real, real nice. So, about how many people do you see down there? Uh, in the main dining room, right there, we seat about ninety people. Ninety, okay. I'd say roughly around now. I'd say about sixty to seventy people. Okay, but in total downtown, we also have a sushi bar. I don't know. if We saw the pictures on that, but in total downstairs, I think you're doing about hundred and eighty. Is that right. right? That's correct. But your dad told me that you also have a private banquet facilities up. Upstairs, which also can be used for overflow at any time that you're uh, that you've got more than that, and I think what's that about 50, 60, something like that. Uh, we could seat about uh, 50 to 60 inside, and we could actually sit about probably an additional four to five tables outside, which would be really which we're really looking forward oh, to. Oh, right now. Oh, so you will have the ability to serve out on that beautiful bal- covered balcony oh, gallery. Ab- absolutely. You know, we're, we're really looking forward to that, and uh, you know, it's just it's only been around for eight weeks, and we're just trying to get an oh, idea yeah. of what's going Through on the here. Mechanic. Through the mechanics. Absolutely, But absolutely. you can't get a better time to serve out there now that spring is coming on. So sure. I know people will be, uh, once they know that's available, they'll be requesting that a lot. Okay, now let's talk about specific operations. The key, of course, is that you're open seven days. Is that right? Seven days a week till 2 in the morning. We open at 11 o'clock on the weekdays. Okay. And uh, on the weekends, we open at 12. And seven days a week, you can come in and eat food, great food, at 2 in the morning. It was uh, it's kind of my idea. And it's like, you know, you make your own bed, you got to sleep in it. And uh, like I said, my dad opens the door and I close the door, you know, every single day. Well, it's very important for two reasons. One, uh, the co- continuity between lunch and dinner is so important because I'm a, I'm a late lunch eater usually, uh, except for when I got to crash for the show. And uh, so uh, many restaurants still have to, because of a shortage of personnel or whatever, still need that break in between. So if you don't go to lunch at 3 o'clock, you're usually out of, out of luck. you got to wait. So that continuity is very important. But the other part that you mentioned is the late night hours. Prior to Katrina, it was not uncommon. In fact, we all ate later. We had the Spanish in us, and many times we wouldn't go to dinner, maybe 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night. Or we would wait and eat till after a movie. It'd go Absolutely. take some at 12, 1 o'clock. Absolutely. And never had a problem finding a restaurant. Post-Katrina, our whole lifestyle has changed, and people have started eating at 5.30 because many of the restaurants in their early stages and some of them still today can't get enough staff, so they don't have the particulars of staff to be allow them to stay open later. So because of that, you have a tremendous advantage that uh, the people who now, are, as our public uh, grows more and more with people coming back home and rebuilding, they can actually feel more comfortable about doing their normal entertainment and know that if they want a late night, if they want to come after the event instead of before the event, they can get great food. So that is really great. Plus the location being on St. Charles Avenue, you couldn't have a better place with the streetcars and the, and the closeness to town. So it really is an ideal location. Okay, uh, so we're open every day. And we're open till 2 a.m. 2 a.m., okay. absolutely. Well, even if later on he cuts back to 1, we won't fault him for it because he'll still be one of the latest restaurants in the city, if not the latest restaurant in the city. All right. I know we are um, making um, people interested in the food. So what we want to do is actually just jump into it, as we always do. Once again, folks, uh, t- take down the number the director puts on the screen. Give us a call. Uh, you're missing our musician today. We are as well. 
but we're hoping to give you another time. We'll allow you to call us and ask any question about this restaurant that we might overlook or any other one that you might be interested in. But let's go ahead and take a look at our first appetizer. Now, you've got a big selection of appetizers on your menu, but we wanted to pick some really uh, great ones. And this one, uh, I know, is a... Uh, Tempura, I call it tempura, but really a fried calamari now, of course. That, that spans all nationalities from uh, Italian to whatever. Uh, but I find it's because of the pepper taste of uh, very similar to some Vietnamese cooking. But why don't you tell us the proper name, and hopefully we'll get that picture up there of the calamari. Sure. Here's a picture. But uh, it's actually a five pepper calamari. We call it a five pepper calamari because, uh, you know, it's flash fried and then there's red, green, and jalapeno peppers in there. It's I think salted. You can see slightly. those really, Absolutely. really show off against that beautiful uh, bank of batter. Go ahead. Sure. And there's actually, it's lightly salted and there's actually white and black pepper. So five peppers, a five pepper calamari, which is very different than a lot of other calamaris out there in the city. I think definitely interesting and all. Now, do you, um, I don't remember, you served that with any type of sauce? All dipping sauce? No sauce and at all. No great. marinara, no nothing and like so that. I, the no reason sauce. why I was bringing that up is, first of all, I never use dipping sauces because to me, the food should, unless it's really something that's not that has no taste at all, the really the food should stand on its own. Absolutely, I totally and agree. That's the problem with a lot of these heavy sauces, and especially in the in the calamari, the marinara or something. Sure. You're really just covering. You got first of all the fry, and then you got the, <laughs> the tomato <laughs> sauce. So you're really covering. You don't know what you're eating. It's just crunchy and tomato. Exactly. Exactly. So this is what's really neat, and and just as you said. New Orleans being, and of course, Asia, many Asian restaurant food being a spice or pepper town, a heat town, you couldn't get a better appetizer because it definitely, with those five peppers, really adds up to heat a notch, which we all love down here locally. Okay, let's move on. We've got another great appetizer. This is beautifully done as well. And I believe it's uh, two seafoods. It's a... Uh, a crab and I think a crawfish, a local crawfish, Rangoon. Is that what we're calling it? Yes, sir. Uh, that's the crab and crawfish Rangoon. You kind of stepped it up a little bit, and we went ahead and used Japanese sweet snow crab and uh, Okay, why don't we, I, I know this picture doesn't do it justice, but we've got this magnificent temple made and, and then other stuff in the front. Now, are these the same uh, ingredients stuffed, or are there different stuffings in each one of these? Uh, these are the same uh, stuffings. It's just we wanted to have uh, a little bit more of an eye appeal, you know. Of just course. We want it to look a little tank. nicer, and uh, the ones up top that are stacked like in a tower, like those I call it are a temple, but it's the beautiful, temple, right? yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Those are great, though. You know, the flower look to it. You know, it's just a uh, it's the sweet uh, tempura crab mix, and also. Uh, crawfish tails and what we do is we mix that with a little bit of cream cheese not very over overwhelming good, good. and uh, we put that in a pastry and we deep freeze it to make it really 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 firm and we go from freezer straight to the fryer so it stands up you know very very nice like that excellent and like I say the presentation is there but it's a wonderful taste folks so I think you you'll really really like that and as I mentioned they have numerous other appetizers and since we are an all restaurant show today we may come back and fill in with some of the ones we don't have pictures but let's go ahead and move on uh now in addition to as i mentioned we have a sushi bar in fact we're going to probably spend a lot more time on sushi in the latter part of the show uh, because this is really uh, unusual to have a, a pan-asian restaurant and a sushi bar usually the sushi bars are kind of relegated to strictly japanese food but here because of the blending it really works well so you can order sushi just like at a, a japanese restaurant to your table or you can actually sit at the sushi bar so what we We've done to, to, in addition to the appetizers listed and shown, we've actually pulled off two sushi appetizers to show you. And the first one couldn't be more attractive. And I know it's like a seafood presented in a martini, which of course is like the uh, presentation today. We got a couple of glimpses of this. Let's talk about this. is really just a magnificent presentation and taste. Absolutely. This is actually a seafood martini. It's been a great seller for us. Uh, as you can tell, the presentation is very, very nice. Uh, we actually take uh, sashimi, which is in Japanese, it translates over to without rice. Right. And this it's is fish, usually fish, of course, without served without rice. Absolutely. So you're slicing the fish, which you can't see as well from here, but it's in the main center part of the martini glass. Yes, sir. And, and what do you do with the uh, fish? Uh, is we, it a particular type of fish you use all the time, or do you vary it, or what? Oh, uh, we keep it pretty consistent. Uh, you know, what we have here is we have scallop, fresh scallop, okay. we have tuna, 
uh, salmon and yellowtail. Okay. And we mix that together in a, a spicy garlic sauce, and we, we go ahead and put that in there. And we yeah, dress these it are raw, people. right? We these wanna, are, yeah. We want to rent all remember raw. people, uh, sushi doesn't mean it has to be raw. You can have cooked sushi, but these particular dishes are definitely raw. Now, we want to tell you and make a little exception to that as we talk to you in Spanish uh, restaurants and some of the uh, the Caribbean cuisines, a thing called ceviche, which many times you can take seafood that's not cooked, and if you marinate it in vinegar or these other, it actually cooks it. It changes. You can't even tell the color of a shrimp. It turns from gray to the pink, just as if you had boiled it or steamed it. Similarly, here, what he's the actual marinating of the sauces is doing a lot to cook the sushi. So if you are afraid of it, because because right away you hear raw, I think once you taste it, it it'll be uh, much more palatable to you, knowing that it has fermented in these uh, cooked in actually the ingredients. Okay, what? And then you're t uh, surrounded with magnificent fruit. Let's talk about that. Which have magnificent colors there. Those are actually ponchatoula strawberries, and those okay, are gray. kiwi right there, and, and the beautiful yeah. green kiwi slices. Sure, sure. And then you now you have some things draped. Anything at the bottom? The bottom is strictly decoration. I know. Uh, it's just for decoration. That's yeah. actually lettuce and. Uh, we actually put some wasabi on the bottom of the martini glass to keep it from falling over. Okay. So. And for those who don't know wasabi, wasabi is actually horseradish, but it's a green color and much stronger than the uh, traditional type of horseradish. Sure. So it's something we always uh, warn you with a caution. Uh, you put a little bit of that in, you know, yeah, <laughs> you're going to clean up your sinuses very quickly. So it, sure. if for those who like horseradish, wasabi is the way to go. Okay, now we want to look at one more. I actually taken one of their rows, one of their signature rows. I believe it's called the Hoshin Special, Hoshin Treasure Roll. Can you tell you, look how magnificent this is presented on the plate. And look how many pieces. Now, again, a roll is just another way of presenting sushi. Sushi has, as opposed to sashimi, rice involved. And in these things, and rolls are actually rolled up and then sliced into pieces. Go ahead and tell us about this roll, please, uh, Stanley. Uh, what we have on the inside of the roll is uh, shrimp tempura. Uh, that's fried shrimp. Sure, fried uh, light, shrimp. Light batter. Japanese light batter. batter. Go Absolutely. Ahead. And we have uh, cream cheese, which is really nice. And on the outside of the roll, we uh, we take the roll in some saran wrap, and we, we mix a, a tempura and a bonito flake and a frukikai. Frukikai is actually a rice seasoning that we all put on there. And we kind of roll it up in there, and we go ahead and cut it. And it's a really, really nice, uh, it's a nice, you know, it's a nice texture because it's very crispy on the outside. The rice is very soft in the middle. And uh, once you get to the filling, it's the, uh, the crispy shrimp and the, the soft, soft, warm cream cheese. It's amazing how a roll is kept together, folks. So that's what part of the deal of, of Japanese cooking, specifically, is, as well as some of the other is the presentation, and especially in sushi. In order to attain that roll, they're using bamboo sheets to form it. It's, so there's a whole process with regard to doing that. And of course, rolls have become the number one American sushi in line. So this really is one that will, and because of the number of pieces, what's great about this, that's why we're showing it to you as an appetizer, that your entire dining party can at least get one, even if you've got like eight or 10 people. So the greatness of this is that uh, it really makes something that everybody can share. So that way, if someone really doesn't like it, they really don't feel like they've wasted uh, sure. an appetizer. So this is great food for appetizers. Okay, folks, we're talking to Stanley Ho. He's the manager of his parents, Stephen and, and his mom's restaurant that has just opened up on St. Charles. The address is what? It's 1601 St. Charles 1601. Avenue. 1601. I knew it was either 1600 or 1600 because it's right on the corner. And uh, a great, great location. They have valet parking for you, if you like, which is really nice. Because uh, I know there's a lot of restaurants nearby, and you're going to be fighting perhaps places. But I always uh, seem to find a place, so you don't have to worry about the valet. Uh, magnificent decor, open all day to late at night. So that's important, seven days a week. Okay, folks, we've looked at our appetizers. So, uh, you know, our next step, as we mentioned, we're not having a musical guest. So please give us a call because, uh, you know, we've got a lot of things to go through the menu, but we'd love to, to hear from our watchers, so the, our audience, so we can see what's in your mind. 
All right, now next thing, of course, we usually do is our, our soup and our salad. Now, you're going to say, Bob, well, every Chinese restaurant in the city has what you have next, and that's wonton soup. And I would say, yes, that is true. Every Chinese restaurant and some other nationalities have it. The problem is this is the most, the, not the problem, the benefit is this is the most unique wonton soup you've ever seen. Uh, for those who love wonton, I'm not knocking it. There are others because it's great. But this is really taking it to a whole new level. It's called, I believe, the Imperial Wonton. Is that right? Yes, sir. It's the uh, Imperial Wonton Soup. This, uh, the wonton itself is actually my grandmother's recipe. And, uh, you know, my Aunt Helen actually came in and actually filled this in on, you know, how to exactly make the, uh, the wonton itself, you know. Now how does that wonton do? You know, give us the recipe, but, like, how would you say it differs in taste-wise? Uh, it's actually, we use, uh, we use the, just the quality of the products that we're using here, the pork and the shrimp we're using. And it's really, really good. Uh, you know, everything's really, really fresh and made per order. And uh, as you can tell, we put you know a great size shrimp in there. We have great contrast with the vegetables inside, with the carrots and the greens. And you know, the wontons come uh, five per order. And they, you know, they're very, very good. You know, they're super. They're very floury wontons. They're they're very soft. And uh, they're just overall. There's a lot of flavor with the herbs and the cilantro in there. And uh, we, I call this the gumbo of all wontons, folks. Usually, as you know, if you've had wonton, first of all, it's usually a clear broth. Notice that this has great coloration because of the stock that's used. Nextly, most of the time, you're either going to get, uh, besides the fried wontons, which in most restaurants are little things that are piled up on a, in a plate that have been cooked, no telling how long, but by the time you get them, usually they're soggy or they're kind of greasy and they're not really as flavored. These are very, very fresh, as he said, cooked to order, which is amazing. Um, notice he has other vegetables, like once again, in most wonton soup, you might have a couple of noodles or a mushroom, and that's the extent of it. Here, as I'm calling it, because uh, either a me uh, vegetable soup wonton or a gum, you've got a full line of vegetables. Look at all the coloration. There's so many colors, that all that adding to the flavor besides the freshness. There's no place else, folks, that you're going to get wonton fried and wonton soup made to order as opposed to just cooking it all day long and just serving it on the same pot. And that's okay. it. Great, that's a great looking bowl they have there as well, isn't it? Yes, it uh, is. <laughs> my mother actually chose all the platings and uh, ah. a lot of the lights. Uh, she chose a lot of the, like in the decor you were talking about earlier, uh, you know, it's a great looking bowl. It's a great looking presentation. And sure. that's one of the things that we're trying to stress here is just uh, a presentation and an ambiance in our whole restaurant. And we're trying to be different. We're trying to be on the cutting edge. And, you know, if you really look at all the plates, uh, they really, really look nice. I like to uh, give my mother a you know, great applaud hand. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, absolutely give a good once they on go that. to the restaurant, and see for yourself themselves, they certainly will agree with you. Absolutely. Okay, now, um, next, of course, are salads. Now, he has several salads on the menu. Um, I'm trying to think whether we're doing one that we're presenting is a Thai salad, the other is a uh, is a chicken uh, grill. Well, I won't say grill because it's, uh, it's not a grilled chicken, but it's a chicken salad. Let's take a look and see, and then we'll discuss this. Uh, I believe the first one is the Thai basil. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, uh, for those who like Thai food or have never tried Thai food, you're going to find this one of the most refreshing um, salads around. So this is great. You know, we're just starting to get warm months. This is a great. It can be used as, a, as really an entree. A lot of people can eat it as an entree with or without a soup because it's so filling, but at the same time, very, very light. It's not a heavy deal. And let's talk about some of the ingredients in uh, your Thai basil, uh, Thai, excuse me, uh, beef salad. This is actually our Thai beef salad. We actually just revamped the uh, the dressing for the Thai beef salad. We've been uh, playing with it for a while now. Well, what are the ingredients? So let's, what ingredients? Because, again, unfortunately, the picture doesn't do justice. We don't see sure. beef, per se. Normally, we don't see big old pieces of beef, sure. which is not, of course, the way the presentation is. Absolutely. Let's talk about all the wonderful ingredients, because Thai and Vietnamese are known for their vegetables and their, the, the fresh and the lightness of their of their food. Mm -hmm. This is the very cool salad. It's actually cool cucumbers and tomatoes, uh, red onions, and cilantro. And it's very, very simple, but it's all in the dressing, like I was saying earlier. Uh, we revamped the dressing. It's actually a basil, pure, uh, a basil cilantro puree with a little bit of jalapeno and garlic inside there and lime juice. Wow, so you so, put a lot in it. So 
see. Absolutely. And we were trying to uh, curtail exactly which kind of uh, fish sauce to use. And uh, fish sauce is kind of like a sweet sauce. Uh, it's not very overpowering, but, you know, gives it a lot of aromatic flavors that kind of blend well with the uh, the basil and the cilantro. And I actually, uh, you know, we were playing with the recipe and, you know, being an Asian family, we're all very, very tight. Uh, our friends over at La Thai Cuisine helped us out with the, with the you know, with a lot of the, the dressing and all that. And uh, just, you know, being in the city, you know, being uh, great neighbors and everything like that, that's one of the things that we're really, really proud about is that, you know, reaching out to our neighbors and helping each other out in our city. And I think that's one of the main things that we need to focus on uh, here in our city is helping each other out. Down yeah, there. couldn't say it better. It really is. And uh, we know the Asian community has gotten even stronger than probably pre-Katrina. So it's great to hear that. Um, once again, the salad dressing and, and the great cilantro, the great, which is some, uh, even though it's Thai, a lot of those same ingredients like cilantro are used in the Jamaican restaurants and Jamaican food, the South American uh, ceviches. So it's a wonderful, wonderful, fresh, but great with the dressing uh, salad. They are a bit, we didn't talk about it, but they are small slices of beef that are cooked, of course, in that dressing. So it gives you a little substance. Uh, you don't need it, as far as I'm concerned, a uh, uh, Thai salad. Just the vegetables are good enough for me. But the addition of the beef gives it a little more heartiness to make it more of a, a complete meal. So I think I hardly recommend. Now, going to the next meal, the next salad, which is definitely an entree salad, you can all split with your friends, is a, uh, I believe you call it a sesame chicken salad. Now, you know, we have a, everybody has a chicken dish or a chicken salad dish. We've gone from fried chicken to grilled chicken. Uh, the important thing is the taste and the preparation and the freshness. Let's take a look at this great uh, salad and tell us uh, what's the name of it again. I don't want to mess it this up. This is right. actually our sesame chicken salad. This is uh, one of four items that actually I put on the menu myself. Okay. And uh, the chicken is not exactly cut right, so the presentation isn't right on the picture. But uh, these are this is an excellent, excellent entree salad. Uh, as you can see, there's a we give a they lot look, of they chicken away. Bit, they look like focaccia slices of, of focaccia bread. Absolutely. But I'm telling you, the the, the taste is great. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, not at all. The uh, the salad itself has beef bean sprouts and blanched snow peas wow. and uh, we toss that together in our honey peanut butter vinaigrette we make all the sauces ourselves and actually learned how to make this salad in Boston uh, the 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 chicken actually is breaded with a panko breadcrumb. It's very, very different. It's a uh, it's a heavier breadcrumb yeah, and uh, used in Japanese cooking. Right. Lot. As I said, we've, we've been talking about this as something as a result of fusion. That panko, which you know, 10 or 15 years ago was relegated to only Japanese cooking, has now been fused into so many different nationalities. And for those who haven't tried it, it's a totally distinctive type of batter to fry. It's light, but it's but it also is heaviness in one respect. So it's kind of Got, got its contradictions in, in flavor, but it's tremendous and it's gotten great, great popularity. So I'm glad you have mentioned that it is panko batter, not the uh, typical flour batter. Sure, sure. Go ahead and uh, tell us any more you want to mention on that. Well, that pretty much wraps it up on the salad. It's a pretty course, simple salad. Well, you said sesame. We never said where the sesame came from. The sesame, actually, we put sesame seeds uh, right on top of the panko breadcrumbs. Uh, and I uh, know that. and I it's think actually think sesame oil. Yeah, sesame oil inside the dressing as well, which gives well, it a, but a I, unique flavor. But uh, I tasted certainly the sesame seeds, and I'm, I love, I call them bird seeds, it's not, not very relevant, <laughs> but I eat a lot of sushi. I just love that crunch of a sesame seed. So putting that with the panko batter is a unique fusion, and I think you'll really like it. So definitely, if you want a chicken salad that is that is one of the different and, and tasty, give it a try. Okay, folks, uh, again, we're talking to Stanley Ho. He's the manager of Hoshan, which is the 1601 St. Charles Avenue, right down the corner, a four- or five-story magnificent building, uh, the main restaurant on the bottom level with additional capacity and private banquet facilities on the second level, uh, broken up into at least two or three uh, dining rooms, including their own sushi bar, beautifully appointed, and most importantly, open every day of the week from mid-morning to 2 a.m. So yeah, early late night. So once again, folks, you can start going out and enjoying yourself on weekends and not have to rush to try and beat the door down at a restaurant in order to still make your engagement. You can wait and eat, eat later, especially many of these engagements we go to, some of these fundraisers and all, and even though they do have a lot of food for different, a lot of, repre a lot of restaurants represented, usually it's micro, micro portions, so you really never get enough and you have to go get something to eat and wet your appetite. Okay, 
Now we want to go ahead and move further. We're actually going to look at entrees, and we want to take uh, a few from each. You know, we always like to mix it up because uh, we want our restaurateurs to show to the public that they handle all elements, not just uh, seafood or not just uh, fowl or beef. To try and get all of that presented to you, and I think uh, again, this restaurant has a tremendous number of entrees. Uh, we're not doing it justice, but I think uh, that's uh, we're following our normal format by showing you three of which we think are really excellent. And the first one, uh, I'm going to let uh, Steve take it, and I'm going to come in and jack because I have a, a little sideline I told his mom and his dad, and uh, I don't know if it was just a typical learning things from a different uh, nationality or what. But go ahead. Let's talk about that first. You tell us, what is this first entree? All right. Let's uh, see which one it is. That's the XOXO Connection. That's standing. Okay. Our XOXO connection is uh, is the biggest scallop you're going to find, and the biggest shrimp you're going to find. And we what we do is we flash fry them, we just lightly fry them, and uh, we we saute them in an XO oyster sauce. Uh, this XO oyster sauce is amazing. It's like uh, fermented onions and shallots. They actually have to watch the pH of the you know in the acidity and the yeast level and the sugar to actually you know target in and zone in on how to make this sauce. And uh, it's it's really really good sauce here, and uh, it's dressed with the asparagus and we actually if you notice on the bottom of the screen we have all, all of our you know all of our chefs actually sign it we want everything to be accountable and we want to make sure everything comes in right and uh, we like you know we've only been over for eight weeks and we always ask we always ask our customers you know how did you like it you know we really really want to hear uh, what our customers have to tell us about you know this is our signature dish so we always ask about our signature dish and uh, it's quite wonderful this on the bottom that's uh, actually Andy Liu he's actually our sous chef uh, of the restaurant, and uh, we're super glad to have him on our team, and he does a wonderful job, as you can see. Okay, now I'm going to tell you our view of it, and why do I say it's different? Okay, two reasons. One, um, as you mentioned, you heard Stanley talk about XO and XO being a special sauce, including watching the pH and all very technical terms that the normal uh, diner may or may not appreciate, even though even those for those who know uh, the new dining trends going into chemistry more than uh, than food <laughs> preparation. But that's not the reason. So what I tried and, and brought to uh, to light to his mom, first of all, is that in America, in English, X, the letters X and O in a sequence of at least three times is an American standard meaning hugs and kisses. That was uh, my idea. My, actually, we fought day and night, my dad and I, my uncle. We sat on uh, one of the big tables that you see in the big round table. We sat there till 3 in the morning talking about how we were going to put this menu together. And uh, it was really unique because in Chinese cooking, if you go to a lot of Asian restaurants, they have, uh, you know, they'll actually spell out the actual Chinese sauce. And uh, this particular sauce or another particular sauce is actually called uh, Yu Chang Jiang. That means uh, the exact translation means a good fish smelling sauce. So we're like, no, 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 we, we, we can't put that on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it sounds kind of crazy. Right. So, you know, my uncle and I, we talked about it. We discussed, you know, what ingredients were in the sauce. Uh, there is ginger and there is soy. I was like, all right, enough said. It's going to be called the ginger soy reduction. And uh, you'll find a lot of that stuff on our menu. You know, it's, it reads very, very easily. And, uh, you know, a lot of our the names of our dishes are very, very unique, like the XO connection. It's, uh, I kind of threw that in there. I knew it was XO sauce, so I just assumed, you know. XO connection, make it kind of sound like the sure. love connection. Absolutely. But the second part of it, to emphasize more, the American interpretation is you heard Stanley's view that his signature disc is signed by the chef that prepared it, Andy. Well, now, doesn't it make more sense as American to have XOXO hugs and kisses from your chef, Andy, as opposed to whether he did a good job or whether he missed? So there, there's the <laughs> difference. So here's where you folks eat me west, the idea that you can look at the same thing or the lemon lemonade thing and have different interpretations. So from his perspective, he's letting you know out there his chef, his chef is doing the best darn job possible and is so proud of it he's putting his name on it. We're saying he's extending sending his arms to you to say to embrace his food and so we got the same hopefully the same result by the taste Absolutely. okay enough of all that hopefully we <laughs> wowed you today with that all right next so we've got uh, the first dish is the seafood we mentioned great great seafood in that in that uh, dish next thing we want to do is take a look at something that um, 
Uh, you know, a lot, most uh, Americans probably wouldn't assume to be Asian. They considered barbecue or Western or some others. But and that is ribs. Well, uh, uh, ribs, you know, are associated with Southern food. All but even though Thai doesn't want to a job, these are great, great ribs. Uh, it's a tower of ribs, and we've got two different angles because it's almost like a Napoleon layered. But let's talk about the ribs, and then of course the magnificent ingredients that you put on the side of it. Absolutely, and like I said, you know, uh, all of our food, you know, the, the, the taste of the food it comes from the quality of the ingredients and the foodstuffs that we buy. And my, you know, my dad's been in the industry for quite, a, you know, for such a long time that his purveyors have really gotten to know him and uh, respect him in the city. And uh, what we've done here is we take the great rib. These are St. Louis ribs here, and now, uh, this beef pork. Let's tell the people up front what kind. Of, these are beef ribs. Beef ribs. Okay. And, uh, what we do here short is short ribs. Go ahead. Short ribs, exactly. And uh, what we do is it's a three-part cooking process. We steam them to make them tender. We fry them to make them crispy, and we saute them in uh, in uh, uh, certain kind of spices that we have. In Asian spices, there's actually red and bell, uh, red and green bell peppers and onions in here as well. So we stack, the fourth step is you stack them. Exactly, exactly, and we stack that right on top of uh, Opelousa sweet potato fritters. We're trying to, you know, support our our community here and our state, and we're trying to use all local products down here. And it's a uh, it's a super great thing that we're doing here. Uh, putting them on the the sweet potatoes, which are really really different. And the three things on the bottom that you saw, the purple things uh, next to the the orange down there, is uh, those are Chinese eggplants, and that comes with a uh, a basil a cilantro puree as well. It's kind of a different puree. Very different, folks. Well, first of all, like I said. Let me comment a little bit. This is, uh, you know, some some people who eat ribs insist they have to have a sauce. That's what more the barbecue, the Western. They've got to have a wet sauce, usually a sweet sauce, to inundate the ribs. But for the really um, diehard rib eating people, they know that the best ribs are dry ribs, dry rub ribs, rubbed with marinade or rubbed with encrusted with, with herbs, as they say. And that really brings out the flavor. So that's that's what they have here. You're not going to be getting some great sauce on top, but you're getting, with the addition of the wonderful vegetables on there, the flavors are just tremendous. But I have to admit, I was taken by a throne at first because I thought I was getting some sushi. These look like you're talking about little sushi rolls, but the uh, eggplant was just tremendous. So it's almost like mashed potatoes, but with a totally different flavor. So I think you'll really like it. So for the rib folk, this is absolutely a great dish. Okay, now the next one is, uh, I think, one of my all-time favorites. I'm, I'm really partial to duck. And I think the Chinese especially have a, a wonderful, wonderful mean, not just one, processes of preparing duck for your enjoyment. This is not only fabulously tasteful, but you're going to see one of the prettiest presentations we've seen in a long time. What do you call this duck? And then we'll talk about it. This is a uh, really unique because it's actually called a pumpkin seed plum duck. Uh, what we do here, it's, a, it's the, once again, it's a three-part cooking process. We braise the ducks every single night, and we hang them up in a five-herb molasses dressing so that the meat can get really, really marinated inside. So we, we braise the ducks to make the skin really crispy. We roast the ducks every morning, and we debone the ducks in the afternoon. And what we do is we take pumpkin seeds. These are organic pumpkin seeds that we put on the bottom here, and we flash fry the whole duck. You get the crispy, uh, crispy skin on the top, you get the tender meat on the inside, and on the bottom you get a very unique crunch, which is the, uh, the pumpkin seeds. And uh, the, the sauce on the bottom there is actually a, a rich pool sauce of, uh, of plum sauce. And we render that through strawberries and plums inside the sauce itself. And uh, I think it looks fantastic. Fantastic, you know. Everybody's been really, really happy with the duck. Uh, it's one of our main sellers at the restaurant, and we're super happy to have that. Because uh, it's a lot of work to be put inside the duck, and uh, we're really, really glad that uh, all of our customers are enjoying it. And not only that, uh, in addition to that, when I finished, I asked uh, Stanley, uh, and w who picked the beautiful flowers? Because I thought the flowers were absolute, and are they were they edible? Because I didn't have a chance to eat. I'd eaten so much. And were they edible? And he informed me that this is typical of the Asian talent to be able to take something of something else and make it into something else and beautiful. And this is actually not a flowers at all. They are so realistic, even to the touch. They are amazing. But these are carrots, you said, and green yes, onions. Yes, sir. Those are right? carrots and green onions. Absolutely. You've never seen a prettier rendition of carrot and green onion. So, you know, if you don't, if you, uh, certainly the carrot for most people could eat. Maybe green onion might be a little strong with some others, but uh, 
I think it's a great treat. But the important thing is the duck is superb. Uh, I think uh, this is something we really want to see. All right, once again, we're talking to Stanley Ho, Ho Shen Restaurant. Opened uh, a few months ago. It's open uh, seven days a week from midday, uh, really before noon till 2 a.m. Can you believe that? And they're determined to stay with that. This is great not only for us who've been so uh, sheltered since Katrina, who haven't been able to stay out late because there's no food restaurants available. I had to come straight home after an event. But even more so, being in the heart of town right on beautiful St. Charles Avenue, what a great presentation for tourists because they can see New Orleans as it used to be, that uh, it, everything is open late and, and you can get wonderful food. It's not just fast food at late night hours. So this is a great tribute to our community and to Stanley and his father and mom that they're making this dedication to give you some of the finest restaurant food available and at almost any time. And the good thing we said about this restaurant is that it is what I call Pan-Asian. It's not just Chinese food. It's not just Japanese. It's multiple layers of Asian foods. So don't hesitate to ask your waiter or one of your co-diners who might be familiar about, well, where, where is it? What, uh, this particular dish, if it doesn't say, like obviously some of them are specifically listed as the uh, Thai beef salad, some others you might not know, but what country is this from? Food is such an educational climate. It's something that uh, when you travel, unfortunately, most Americans want to have all their fast food places. The key when you travel is, to me, learn through food. There's no way better to uh, learn about a country or a city than how well uh, their dishes and how they taste. So here you can get a great education and never leave New Orleans. So you, for those of us who maybe don't have the time or the, or the funds to go to some of the wonderful Asian capitals of the world, you can now try it all here at this restaurant. So we're so proud of it and happy uh, that it's finally coming to reality. Okay, as we said, you can call us. Uh, we just about finished our entrees. We're uh, going to go ahead and talk a little bit about beverages and desserts, and that will wrap up the pictures. Then if we don't have any calls, then we'll go back and talk about, as I mentioned, some other menu items, specifically the sushi, which uh, I really is a big promoter of. So uh, let's move on forward, and let's talk about beverages. I mean, you've got a magnificent bar there, and I'm sure you can do just about everything. So tell us a little bit about what you're interested in. And first of all, in the cocktails, and then we'll talk about wines, et cetera. Sure. Uh, you know, our desserts are really great, and, uh, you know, we actually outsource all of our desserts, but we do a lot of things to change them up. We uh, put a Petit Syrah, you know, it's a very, very nice wine, uh, you know, right in between the Merlot and the Pinot Noir. We mix that with strawberries and sugar, and we put that over a chocolate mousse cake that we get, and uh, that's wonderful. We get a great, uh, we have a great carrot cake that's really, really great as well. And uh, our beverages, you know, I actually... Yeah, let's talk about... We're, we're going to see that in a moment, not to interrupt you. But what I want to do is tell the folks, because, I mean, everyone has to have something to wash this down. Well, we're going to be able to talk in depth about those particular desserts we're going to see in a minute and what's involved. But let's talk about, generally, uh, some of us non-alcoholics, you know, you have a great line of teas. You have, of course, the typical sodas, sure. uh, combinations. But for those who want some alcohol with their dinner, I mean, I know uh, I've seen some of the magnificent and glassware, so I know probably your bartenders can do any type of cocktail, all the mojitos, all the things that are, are fun, and, and, and especially the martinis, just like serving the food now in martinis, the different variations of martinis have become uh, uh, a, a, you know, a menu in itself. So I know you do that, but let's talk about wines. Uh, where do you focus? I, 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 would, I would assume that uh, you're not just domestic wine, since we're talking about food from all over the, all over the continent. Tell us a little bit about that place uh mainly uh what we have is an all uh, you know we have a very very big wine list you know it's uh it's 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 pretty sh you know it's it's right there where you could actually get a little bit of everything i would say it's more international than anything right there's a lot of different types of wines we have a lot of malbecs we have a viognier's we have a, a rioja we actually have okay. a lot of different wines we right. have uh, and we also another thing that's really unique about our wine list is that uh, i decided to go ahead and take all uh, a lot of really really good wines and put them on the, by the glass uh you know like i said uh, you know because of our cuisine you know there's you know there's a wide variety of cuisine you know yes. a lot of food you 
you can get. Uh, you, you might be having steak or the ribs, and I might be having the sushi. So uh, you know, I might you know go ahead and you know instead of buying a whole bottle to get you know something nicer that's just served by the glass, uh, you know I went ahead and put the nice wines by the glass as well. Excellent. So, I think uh, this is an important trend because. Uh, uh, not only because wines continue to increase in, in price, just like everything else, but also the idea of being able, instead of sticking with just a house red or white, when we're going to these international foods, not being afraid of buying a bottle of an Australian food or a wine or a, or a Japanese or a you know, Chinese wine. So that way we're not afraid. Of, we, oh, we commit to this big level and we don't like it. Okay. Here, by trying by the glass, once again, you and your diners can try samples of wines so you really get uh, an understanding of it and a better pairing of the wines with the food you're eating as opposed to limiting yourself to just well-known French wines, etc. So I think you are right on track there with that parallel, both uh, the wines with the food. All right, now let's take a look at a couple of the desserts and then we'll go back and talk about other items that we haven't don't have pictures of. And I think uh, Stanley was jumping to it. I had to interrupt him because we didn't want to give it away when we're going to show you the picture. Then we're going to ask him to Re- repeat those wonderful descriptions. So I believe the first one is the uh, chocolate mousse cake. And let's take a look. Look how magnificent this folks is. So why don't you tell us about this great creation? I know you started a little earlier. What we do is uh, we just take uh, our chocolate mousse cake and we take strawberries and sugar and a petite Syrah. And uh, like I said earlier, you know, it's right in between a Merlot and a Pinot yeah. Noir. So it's got so, a very so, yeah, good. For people don't know Syrah. Is, Syrah is not a real, I mean, it's relatively new on the scene, even though for the wine. But it is. You're putting, putting it in a good place. So it's a, a deep red in between a Merlot and a, and a Cabernet. So if you had either one of those, then you, you'll get an idea of what a Shirai. So go ahead. So you have Shirai in there. What else we got in there? Beautiful. Uh, uh, those are fresh strawberries, uh, Ponchatoula strawberries. Like I said, you know, we're very proud to, you know, try to help our community out and buy local products here. And, uh, I mean, look how beautiful those uh, strawberries are. And it looks really, really nice right. with the wine. So uh, it kind of blends in nice with the chocolate. And it's not very, very sweet. Uh, uh, being Asian, our, our desserts aren't as sweet. Uh, you know, funny you say that is because um, in... Uh, a lot of Asian cooking desserts, uh, real Asian desserts, we use a lot of beans, uh, like right. you know, red beans and green beans. Green bean, right? People in America gets very confused with the sure, red beans. Sure, and uh, it, and also a mousse, but a, a chocolate mousse is a very sweet item. So what happens is you tone down that sweetness, sure, which doesn't sound right. Why would you want to do that? But it really is for flavor. So you've toned it down, one, by putting the fresh fruit, which is a natural sweet, not the artificial sweet, and then the actual wine bringing in a stronger flavor to further tone down the sweetness. Absolutely. So not that it's taking away the sweetness, it's putting it into a more mature level. So it's not just everything tastes so sweet that you, you know, I get nauseated with some of the sweetness that we put in today. I think we've, we've ruined a lot of desserts by going to sweet uh, cheesecakes. I mean, in the old days, you only had New York cheesecake, which tastes like cheese. Sure. Today, they moved it all. They infused so much whipped cream and sugars into a cheesecake Absolutely. that you have no idea what you're eating anymore. You know, they're all, all just overly sweet. Okay, now let's take a look. At, that is a beautiful, beautiful one. So for chocolate lovers, Valentine's Day's passed, but it's a beautiful, almost looks like a bird of paradise the way it's arranged, it? even though it's in the two colors. Now let's take carrot cake again. A carrot cake doesn't sound like an Asian dish, and normally it wouldn't be considered. But let's take a beautiful look at this uh, presentation that is superb and tell us all about it. Uh, this is our carrot cake. On the bottom is actually some caramel and we put uh, shredded carrots on the side uh, for a little bit of garnish and uh, inside is actually real carrots. I mean these are real carrots. Uh, these are it's a great dish. It's very very spongy and uh, we put some uh, strawberry straws next to it and uh, it's got a beautiful flower on top and that's actually uh, it's made from uh, icing so that's actually edible as well. And are the cross carrots, is those carrots there? Those are uh, carrots, is correct. And uh, they've got, I'm sure, some type of sauce on them, and then I can see something glistening on it. No, it's just the, uh, a glaze, just like a demi Same glaze, glaze that you use? 
So is I, I miss whether the glaze is a sweetener or what are you doing there? Because carrot cake, even though it is a flavorful of carrots, it's a, more of a neutral. It doesn't go too sweet, doesn't go too sour. So sure. that's, what is your glaze doing? I might have missed glaze is, what, what um, said it did. The glaze is actually mainly for texture. And uh, anybody that's had carrot cake before, there's a lot of texture. There's you know there's walnuts inside. There's there's carrots inside. And there's a lot of different things going on in there. And the glaze is actually just on top to give it a little bit more of a uh, kind of like a gel texture. It's really really nice. And that's one of the th my favorite things about eating is that it's not just the taste. It's really just, you know, how it feels in your mouth and really just how, it, how everything blends together and, you know, how well it goes down. Sure does. Okay, folks. Well, we're out of pictures. Haven't heard from any of y'all. I guess y'all all sleepy uh, whatever. Or just being Wednesday at work like most of us should be. Uh, what we're going to do now, we're going to pick a few more items from the entree because I told you there were a lot of entrees. And then we're going to talk specifically about some sushi. Um, I saw one that I did get to try, and it's basically a signature dish. It's called your Hoshun Delight. Hoshun Delight. Can you tell us about that entree? Uh, that's actually another family recipe. It's my uh, grandma's recipe right there. And uh, she used to make this soup. It was called Goda Tang every time I was sick. And this is a very, very healthy, uh, healthy choice here. There's actually scallop, there's shrimp and there's chicken in here and uh, a lot of wide vari uh, variety of actually, uh, mushrooms in here. There's shiitake mushrooms, black mushrooms, oyster spores. Very, very healthy. It comes in an egg infused, uh, like kind of like a, a, a stock. You know, what they do is they take the chicken stock and we, we take eggs and we kind of uh, egg whites only and uh, we kind of scramble the egg whites in there and put that in, melt that in with all the uh, vegetables as well. And uh, super, super healthy dish uh, served with white rice and uh, I think it's it's a wonderful dish to have, you know. Uh, when it gets cold, you know, to, you know, don't let it don't let it stop you, even though summer's rolling around the corner. But it's a super great dish. It's very very filling, and uh, you know, it's really really good for you as well. Another thing with Asian, of course, is the emphasis on vegetables. And as we've said that before a little earlier, that uh, the different vegetables they're sharing, uh, we do have an audience that is ge are geared as well as just America per se, trying to move towards some, not necessarily being totally vegetarian, but just more of the healthy items. I know you have a lot of dishes, all of them almost using some vegetables, but any particular ones that are vegetarian in, you know, in purpose? Uh, that's, that's a great question. We have uh, a flash fried tofu for people that you know don't want to eat meat, right. and uh, we have a lot of, uh, like the other day we had a wedding party, and we had uh, two vegan guests. And uh, it was a little difficult to, you know, try to adjust. But, you know, after everything, my dad, you know, and I clicked together. It was my dad and I serving the food, uh, cooking the food, and planning the party. So it was, uh, it was really nice to work with my dad and my mom on that. And uh, we actually have a fried tofu. It's a crispy tofu that's served over uh, bean sprouts and mixed vegetables in a brown sauce, which is really, really nice and really different. And uh, tofu, for people that don't really know much about tofu, right, or uh, it's a, of it, yeah. a, a lot of textures. You know, you have... Uh, soft tofu, very soft, you know, medium tofu, medium firm, and firm tofu. We've actually chose the medium firm tofu to go with our uh, our fried crispy tofu. And uh, that's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful, healthy dish, uh, just like the Hoshan Delight. Uh, but, you know, it's it's really, really refreshing, and uh, it's nice to have on the menu for, for our guests who don't want to eat meat, you know, or, you know, actually very, very health conscious, and uh, it's an excellent, excellent choice as well. And two more, which I found on you in the restaurant and didn't didn't try yet, but one is a lamb dish, and you don't see lamb on many of the Asians, more of the Mediterranean, French, etc. So, tell us how you came up with the lamb and what the name and what the preparation is. Please. Sure, uh, lamb is really different, especially for Asian restaurants. Uh, right. Very, very different. And uh, what we've done, we have two types of lamb dishes. And uh, my best friend's dad came in there, and he gave a great description. He's Italian, and he says that if you like veal asabuco, you're going to love the tompo lamb. Uh, it, pretty, it basically falls off the bone itself. It's actually a hind shank. And uh, what we do is we braise the meat in the hind shank uh, with, a, uh, with kind of like a, a dark uh, bouillon type. Uh, of, of a sauce, and it's okay. really very, very rich, and it comes standing on top of braised cabbage, which is really, really nice. It's a nice contrast between the, the rich flavors of the meat and the sauce, 
and uh, having the braised cabbage is really, really nice because it's uh, very light and very watery, so it's just really good to have the contrast. Yeah, and the right. next lamb, uh, lamb dish that we have, we actually serve it with a mango, tomato, and avocado salsa. It's uh, it's, it's like a little, I'm not, have you had it before, Walk? Uh, no, I didn't. You I'm haven't sorry. had it yet? Actually, no, go ahead, but tell us about yeah, it. Please. But it's super, super nice. We have, uh, they're actually, uh, it's the rack of lamb, you know, and it's a super, ah, super nice dish. A rack of lamb. Rack I didn't see lamb. that. Now, that's fabulous. And, uh, you know, my dad it's a traditional person. Uh, every time he eats prime rib, he eats it with horseradish. And every time he has lamb, he has to have uh, mint jelly, So mint which jelly. is really nice. So uh, it comes on top of Italian spaghetti, which is uh, we chose these noodles uh, specifically because of, you know, the texture of the lamb. We didn't want to go with the soft, soft noodle. Right. We went ahead and went with a uh, firmer uh, Italian spaghetti, which is very, very different. And we put uh, coarse black pepper on there. And uh, it's a fantastic item. And uh, like I said, it's, uh, you know, the salad on the side, which is really, really great. The uh, avocado, mango, and tomato salsa is really, really nice. So there you go, folks. See, they're even pushing the envelope beyond Asia to reach out to the Mediterranean uh, and to the Italian, which is, of course, part of the Mediterranean. So if you can't find any Asian dish, that certainly sounds like a great, hearty uh, Mediterranean or Italian dish. Now, another one sounds so French. Which uh, I had to ask about is the beef la l'orange. So tell us, please, around that, because that, again, uh, struck me as unusual in your restaurant. Uh, the beef la l'orange is actually uh, it's stir-fried beef. It's a used beef tenderloin. It's just great, great cut of beef. And uh, what we do is we kind of saute it uh, with orange peels. Uh, and we actually have to, it takes quite a lot of time. We have to actually take the rind out, because the rind makes the, uh, the sauce very, very bitter. So mm-hmm. it takes quite a while to make the uh, sauce. And uh, we take the orange rinds. Uh, the, the peels itself, and we saute them in oil and garlic, and uh, we use uh, a certain type of French liqueur, which is Dave. really, really great, and uh, great, great flavors in the uh, beef l'orange, and it's come dressed out with uh, Chinese spinach as well, which is... So it is a, a testimony, a homage to France. Absolutely, absolutely. I was afraid you were just throwing out the name. No, no, really? no, not at all, not at all. We're actually, uh, uh, we've actually, well, I've been experimenting with a duck l'orange. Everybody's been loving the pumpkin seed plum duck and it comes with the plum sauce and uh, you know we're you know we're trying to change things up every once in a while and uh, for a couple of guests that you know come in you know quite often uh, that have the duck you know every time they come in I always ask them you know if, if you'd want to go ahead and call me in call it in 30 minutes ahead and I'll have the sauce ready for you, you and go. we can even do a duck l'orange which wow. is really really excellent yeah that's great that's because that, that's the more traditional known but again knowing knowing the Asian version of duck along with the l'orange a really attempting fusion. All right, now let's talk a little bit about sushi before we close up because we're getting near the end of the hour. And uh, your sushi bar seats about what ten? I think. I, I think it seats ten comfortably. Six or ten. Absolutely. Comfortably. And again, it's open the same hours as the restaurant. Is that right? Uh, yes, sir. The okay. absolutely same. So it hours. doesn't shut down at all. It, no, it's not open at all. straight through. Absolutely. Uh, they're featuring all the wonderful. I mean, the list of rolls. Uh, America has taken sushi into its own, translated poofed out rolls. I mean, rolls divine, as we saw a couple earlier. Uh, for us purists who uh, <laughs> like the traditional stuff, it, it's hard to get to. But at the same time, you know, you are providing a great line of, of, of fish, fresh fish. For those who know what they're talking about, today I had a wonderful, and don't get upset, but uh, toro, which is the tuna belly, and tuna belly is the uh, most prized part of the tuna. Everyone all talks about tuna, but as you move down to the belly, it's very marbleized, and it's very much like steak, and tastes like butter, so it's, <laughs> if you don't like to eat butter, I guess you wouldn't like it, but uh, the important thing here, uh, I tested the chef with several items that are not on the ordinary uh, shelf, and that do appeal to the people who with more knowledge of sushi, and he responded greatly. So I can testify that even though they might be out of a some particular thing, or, since it goes so quickly and not everything can be ordered in great great uh, bulk, uh, I hardly recommend you give it a try because whether you're a six, uh, sushi purist or whether you just want the newest and the fanciest and the biggest roll possible, they're going to be able to accommodate you. 
Absolutely. Um, now, uh, Stanley, before we go, anything else you want to tell us? Because then we are getting close to the end of the day. Uh, you know, just we're super proud of the restaurant. I just want to say, uh, say thank you so much to all of our loyal customers that have been coming in, uh, you know, on a weekly basis. Everybody's been super, super great coming in for us. And uh, I just want to say thank you so much for joining my family and uh, taking care of us. All right, folks, look, we did it without a musician. We don't want to make a practice of this because <laughs> we like to honor both the rhythms. See you at the restaurants and see you next week.